ಟ್ರಾನ್ಸ್ಲೇಟ್ ದಿಸ್ ಲೈನ್ ಓಕೆ ಕಮಲಕ್ಕೆ ವೋಟ್ ಮಾಡಿ ಇನ್ ಯೋರ್ ಲ್ಯಾಂಗ್ವೇಜ್ ಕಮಲಕ್ಕೆ ವೋಟ್ ಮಾಡಿ ವಿಷ್ಣು ಟ್ರಾನ್ಸ್ಲೇಟ್ ಇನ್ ತೆಲುಗು so uh, clearly uh, we don't need a, need a unifying language uh, throughout south india is it uh, i think yeah i agree on that kannada kannada and telugu is similar tamil and malayalam are similar how about Just hindi to mix how about hindi so, i mean all the south languages are similar but but still i how can't agree yeah hindi that. also it's it's kamal kamal ko vote do so yeah so don't you know all the thing so don't you yeah. think huh? the rhetoric that uh, hindi can be a unifying language can actually be better It's example even in cairo as well don't you think that that translation like the amount of translation which you guys do in your work or even central central agencies do in their legislations the the reason why they don't try to translate in in regional language because there is a cost factor and also because it's a more easier option if hindi is, if hindi can be an option isn't it no joel no joel i i i have to disagree joel yes hi hello welcome to argument of the podcast stage to discuss deliberate and debate on various contemporary social legal and political issues today with you we are two argumenters myself maria and with me we have joel you're going to miss minaj for this episode because he'll be joining us asap for the next one we have two amazing speakers with us to be in the batch of argumenters pascal and vishnu who will be introducing themselves to you uh, so hello uh, uh, we uh, myself and vishnu are obviously from cairo india and i'm very glad to be on this podcast session organized by argumenter podcast uh, Uh, first of all before we actually move into the uh, session um, we would like to extend a hearty congratulations to argumenta podcast for starting such an initiative uh, in this year despite uh, having a lot of setbacks I mean, like most of us have been facing a lot of setbacks right away so it's indeed a commendable initiative to actually voice out people's opinions through podcasts which are quite famous among the young community these days so if vishnu would like to take over yeah sure uh hi guys uh, first of all thanks joel and maria and minaj i believe for this opportunity this is a really uh, innovative idea so yeah so cutting to the chase uh, me and pascal are obviously from cairo india and we're glad to be on the show well cairo india is a brain child of mine and pascal i think i would say we started off probably a year ago roughly so roughly this was just a thing which we had uh, envision for ourselves but now it's turned into a starting to turn into a beautiful thing so it is an ngo uh, which focuses on harnessing the legal momentum in fighting for the rights of the people more oftenly we believe in society being a progressive one and i think uh, the constitution requires creative interpretation from it time to time and that's how you evolve as a society and you evolve as a country so cairo really wants to be a part of this beautiful transition and i think it's very important uh, with rising turbulences across the country over a varied number of issues we do need somebody to voice out opinions and fight for the rights of people so that's exactly what cairo does so over the past few months we've extensively taken uh, a few steps which we could do in our capacity to educate people mm-hmm. about their rights in the form of scheme reports government scheme, analyzing government scheme reports etc and we also intend to file public interest litigation across the forums uh, in india to fight for the rights of the people i think that's what essentially cairo is if there's anything to add pascal you can Uh, yeah. so adding on to that uh, i genuinely believe that we at cairo have one simple motto to i mean like towards which we are working for 
So right, generally something is like something which is perceived to be anti-government in most cases. So whatever being vested as rights is something that is granted to you by the government. I think we as individuals at Cairo are looking forward to a positive collaboration with the state and I mean like the government mechanisms and administration. That is how I think the real, I mean like the potential of a right vested to the person could be brought out to the fullest extent. So that is what we are trying to achieve through what do we call as a symbiosis of law and working towards the welfare of the people by through legal means, that is essentially. So right should not be perceived something as an anti-government, used to threaten the government, used to like question the government. That, did, that does not work that way. We at Cairo firmly stand by that and we are trying to work with the government and administration in whatever way possible in the simple capacities we could and that is where we are actually looking forward to uh, do our further activities too. Amazing guys. So uh, like like exactly like they said, Cairo is like the one of the best initiatives uh, from their part. And I would re really request our listeners to uh, go out and check it in their social media handles as well. So right now, like Joel always says, let's move into the elephant of the room, of course. So today, like, as we had been discussing, okay, what just the, what is that huge topic that we'll be deliberating about? Uh, you know, similar to all those uh, episodes we had last year, including that, that is you know, the border disputes and right to freedom of speech and discussion, a lot of, lot of uh, versatile topics came into our minds. So today the topic, not topic per se, the topics that we've decided to discuss upon uh, include center-state relations in, in the light of a couple of, you know, a lot of, lot of things that we'll be talking about today. I don't want us to list them one by one, you will be, you know, you can just slowly emerge them into topic by topic. So Joel, would you like to begin with the you know, existing mechanisms, how well India is moving about the kind of situations that we have uh, currently. Over to you. Um, yeah. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Maria, for trying to serve on, on the topic. So th this is a very uh, emerging topic of sorts with regard to the center and the state having uh, a, a kind of cordial or a kind of a, a kind of tussle happening in between different states and, and the central government as well. So the, the 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 reason why this issue is being raised is because several of the events that are actually happening throughout. The country and uh, what we will be stressing upon uh, in the, during this entire podcast, as Maria has stated, with regard to what are the constitutional uh, aspects with regard to the center state relationship, how uh, what is the role of the opposition, what is the role of the center to try and uh, have a cordial relationship with the uh, state which don't have the same uh, party go uh, as the government or uh, other mechanisms as well with regard to the, the recent legislations, be it the farm laws. Uh, or, or even be it uh, with regard to the, the GST collection and, and things like that. So these are several of the disputes that are actually being on the rise and, and widely being talked about. So um, Pascal Vishnu, do, uh, do, do, uh, in, uh, do uh, in, uh, let us know as to what is this uh, aspect of, of center and state? Like, you know, what is the constitutional aspect with regard to center and state? What, what kind of powers does the, the, the center have over the state that, that the state cannot circumvent these laws which have, which have been passed by the center? And how does that be very effective in a, in a healthy de democracy like India uh, in the national level as well? Uh, yeah, well, to start off with, in the constitutional scheme of things, uh, the center state relations are clearly defined in party level, uh, ranging, from, uh, ranging from Article 245 to 255, and you have other uh, administrative relations in the next chapter. So it's pretty vast. To start off with, the you have to essentially understand that it's not easy to cover such a big topic as center state relations. I mean, it's the most complicated topic of uh, constitution, which uh, many people have come across and is hailed so. So India has a very peculiar relationship where it, when it comes to center and state. Now, if you see Article 255, it's 245, it's very clear. It clearly says that you say that India's center state relations is more center dominant than the state dominant, largely to an extent because the party which comes into power at the center tends to have a domination over all the policies and decisions which the states will take. It's merely because of the list which have been provided and wherein the law can be enacted in their particular spheres. Now, that is the control of very important subjects is given to the, uh, to the center, which makes it 
technically the boss of all the states as well so emerging from what's happening in the, the recent trend is uh, that the party which is dominant in the center tends to favor only those parties in which that that part that particular party is in power in that particular state or with a coalition with that state in that within that state so it's pretty clear i mean no there's no denial but there's nothing we can really do about it because i don't even think that it's uh, but uh, or discretionary but this no don't you think that with the sarkaria commission which came about which was which was actually intended for better relationship between the center and the state and you had the interstate councillors being set up and also with regard to the power of the governor and that the governor should uh, should have should be a, having a detached figure and uh, should not be a member of the ruling party so with these uh, recommendations being held said by the commission also some, most of them mm-hmm. or, or some being uh, enacted don't you don't you think that that there still remains a gray area in the relations between the center and the state though it is intended to be solving the disputes and, and amicably uh, be it even in coalition governments also uh, what we are seeing in 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 bihar uh, with the, with regard to the, the jdu just just today what we are seeing is that uh, many uh, there are being claims that the op- the opposition party which is the rjd is just trying to to claim that they have they having control over some of the mlas of, of the jdu or even they losing out some of some, some mlas in arunachal so don't you think that there is some kind of a communication gap or is it some kind of an uh, ambition uh, which has been set forward by the center so, so, so some of the allegations being, being being raised with regard to the deteriorating center state relationship uh see i think can i go with answer yeah yeah so Personally, I feel that center-state relations. Before we actually delve into this topic in particular, when we're talking about deteriorating relationship between states and center, there's a lot to keep on the political side of view as well. This center-state relation, even though it's a vastly constitutional topic that we're discussing here currently, it has a lot to do politically uh, when it comes to talking about uh, all the stuff we are debating over here. So every single issue which uh, Joel is asking to, I mean, like you are asking me to comment upon currently, be it the MLA poaching issue or the Bhagat to the appointment of the governor or any other issue which are going to be discussing uh, in session today there's one view which is constitutional and that's obviously that the constitution is obviously from where any other registration in india it, it is the book I mean, like which matters the most in the nation so having said that obviously center state relations has been an issue where there has been a particular trend when these issues have arisen so i think the very first instance when center state relations as an issue came to question was in 1967 so that was the year when congress as a absolute majority party in the center lost power in almost eight of the states uh, which were existent over there west bengal kerala many other states had registered congress in their respective regional re- regions congress although they managed to hold on to a power by a mere majority of i think around 280 seats in the parliament back then they couldn't have the same absolute control over the state back then so that was when center state relations as a issue first came into question in independent india so when looking at that juncture when uh, that is when the schools of what we are talking about the center state relations also broke open so that was one school which continues to be which is watching for a uh, relooking into the center state relations based on the constitutional aspects and i mean like entirely like amending the entire constitution what they are suggesting is like looking into the developmental aspects and how time has changed and they want one school is requesting for an entire amendment of whatever we are seeing currently and the another school which is present which is like asking us to stick to the constitution the constitution which has been framed in respect to the founding fathers of a nation and everybody and since it has been decided that way it has to be that way and whatever is derived from that is what should continue for the years to come so these are the two different schools which have existed till this day uh, till this day so again this issue didn't come into question i think there was no big issue in around the, like the first decade of the 2000 chess people when there was this coalition government in power there again uh, vishnu was talking about even in center when there was a coalition government and there was a coalition government which was running the nation the center state relation was not a big issue because there was some what do you call the ambit of like bargaining power the states had the bargaining power to bargain with the center and like uh, say alignments and like so they were able to convince the center since they were in the coalition now this center state relation again has become an issue since 2014 when the bjp emerged as the single largest party in the parliament that is when after this issue this issue has come to the open i mean like to the open front again so before we actually talk more about 
all these um, RJD MLAs, these issues. You need to, I mean, like, I think we need to understand the basic fact that these are like mostly politically motivated. If there is something called as an issue which is center state, I think 90% of the issues are basically politically motivated. Less talking about 10% which come to the constitutional aspect of things which are talking about currently. So I think we should keep this in mind before setting the agenda and we go forward to uh, discussing all these political concerns, MLAs being forced and all the governor issues, issues, recommendations of Satkaria Commission. Whatever it is, we have to see it from the political ambit as well before we actually talk purely based on the constitutional aspect of things. Joel. Uh, exactly, Pascal. And uh, Joel, in considering to the Sarkaria Commission report, I think, uh, don't you think that this, uh, the significance of this report even gets bigger, like with the recent uh, incidents and uh, the issues that had happened with the governor and the state per se? I think the best example I can give is what had happened in Kerala a couple of days back. Uh, with respect to the issues, uh, yes, yes. set up a, an assembly session to discuss upon farmers, right? I think that had been, uh, you know, pointed out numerous times when I considered this uh, report on hand and what were the issues that had happened with the, uh, from the governor's part and the government's part in conducting the session. So, uh, like, keeping the central state relation to be, I, I completely understand it's a very complex part. It's, a, you know, part 11 definitely gives for vast uh, understanding. And to break down them one by one, Definitely, as Pascal said, we, we would uh, need a political interpretation of it. So I think let's take this uh, issue that had happened in Kerala on how had, uh, okay, what, what could have been done from the part of the governor's end and from the part of the government uh, to resolve the issue in, a, in, a, in an amicable manner rather than, you know, making it worse than uh, ever, worse than ever that the state had pushed. So, uh, Joy, if you had a view on that, you could, I think you can, uh, you know, explain them together. For easy understanding. Yeah, so what happened was that, uh, like as Maria had pointed out with regard to the Kerala government uh, uh, and the governor and the governor, the, the, the tussle. So what happened was that the governor had turned down the request to summon a special sitting of the assembly, uh, which, which yeah. was actually with regard to the three farm laws. So, but then uh, there was also a question as to like, you know, can the, what has, like, what powers do the, do the governor have and can the power, can, is the governor being biased with regard to uh, like the the center and, and not not allowing uh, yeah. uh, this, this because there has been some kind of a tussle uh, even in the previous time as well and also uh, even today as well the West Bengal government has also uh, uh, the, the chief minister Mamta Banerjee also also has, uh, has uh, written, a, a, written a, a letter to written by Mamta Banerjee with regard to removing the West Bengal governor. Uh, also seems to be clear that you know there there, there has been exactly. some kind of a confusion or cluttering with regard to uh, the issue at hand. So I think uh, Vishnu, you, you you wanted to say with re with regard to the the constitutional aspect and, and how far it can be can can the constitutional aspect be divorced from the political aspect of of things. See, one thing we have before we delve into things, I think the important aspect which comes in this regard is you know legislative competence. Now, more often than not, the, the conflict of interest arises in who's the competent legislature and uh, the power of governor. When we talk about power of governor, I think the power of governor is absolute when it is as described in the constitution. But if you see in the recent examples of Maharashtra or Rajasthan, the entire drama before the Supreme Court, which is becoming a very, you know, uh, positive, I don't know if it's positive or I think it's definitely positive for lawyers who are looking for litigation, but, and as a litigant myself, I think it's positive, all the drama before Supreme Court. You know, the judiciary is starting to take a very legislative role when it comes to very important aspects, such as elections, such as the power of governors. So uh, this is becoming uh, very diverse, uh, you know, do, across the trend. And the talking about uh, competence of legislature, the interpretation of the constitution, you know, it must be very broad and liberal and you should give, uh, uh, you know, a very liberal interpretation in deciding which legislature, uh, which legislature is competent in making laws at a particular subject or, you know, uh, having before questioning the laws and deciding which legislature and when is, uh, what is the validity of that legislature. So, it's very uh, complex to understand as such, but I think you're, you're right. I mean, what happened in Kerala, it's all at the end of the day open to political interpretation. So, yeah. 
adding on to that i believe that uh, this is not an issue which is I mean, like one not to kerala or uh, west bengal or such i mean like these issues of special sessions being called by the government and i mean the governor refusing to give assent has been like happening time and again even in chatisgarh i think in october we had an issue with bhupesh bagel government call, calling for a special session again and governor anusulia was not giving the assent for the same so i think uh, this needs to be again interpreted really as vishnu was pointing out i think in the chatisgarh case we have the governor writing back to the state government that why would you want a session uh, i mean like at present when only two months ago the monsoon session had ended so i think that is a case of concern worrying concern towards us law students and litigants as well when a governor starts to raise quite some awkward questions to the government but i don't think the kerala case is again a similar case cause like i find the kerala issue to be somewhat politicized in, i i mean as a personal opinion again open to interpretation cause like as far as report i have i have heard the governor had written back to the cm requesting for the emergency i mean like what was the emergency with such an emer- special session need to be called at this juncture everybody knows what india is going through currently the entire world is battling a pandemic and i think the governor had merely asked for the i mean like the reason to call for such a special session in in such urgency that was what i was hearing from the reports i had gone through earlier and i think uh, as for now latest reports are suggesting that the governor has granted assent for the session and it will be scheduled on the 31st of december quite essentially and as we know the kerala communist government is actually planning on appealing against the farm laws which is which is for precisely for what the session was called as again so like i don't think this needs to be an issue again which needs to be deliberated upon the constitutional front what happened in chatisgarh might be a I mean, case of concern and can be deliberated upon the constitutional front and what happened in bengal with regard to the ips officers issue the center calling for a particular names and list of ips officers to be transferred back to the i mean like put on central deputation that is a cause of concern cause uh till this day the center only request for the certain number of officers which I mean like which it could call back and it up on the state to actually i mean like grant assent to the request of the center or i mean like deny the assent so that these are like one of issues which needs needs to be i mean like looked into in those particular issues the fact of the issues need to be looked into and that is how we arrive at the conclusion passing in the correspondence to what you just said the proud uh, issue that has been uh, in place of kerala which is kind of different from what is happening in uh, west bengal or what is happening in any, any other state in similar situation and the response from the part of the government uh, like exactly like i have heard stated that there were uh, you know it is this consider this is considered to be an issue of emergency or importance because they really feel that uh, different associations and organizations representing farmers from kerala or from the state per se Uh, were also you know equally affected by the uh, three farm acts that were passed by the center moreover uh, they even brought about uh, representations from these uh, you know farmer communities uh, and other associations that were there within the state to come forward against the uh, bill and they want these three, three acts to be obviously revoked plus they were obviously you know not not open or willing to any sort of amendments but a pure repeal of three laws plus finally the most important uh, you know concern for the part of the state government to take this as an emergency session was of course the possibility of delay in a passage of a minimum support price bill like you know as promised by the sender and the kind of uh, you know assurance that they want from the sender per se so this is i think this this kind of adds on to the interpretation that requires to be addressed with respect to the issues that are there in kerala and like which uh, with which i think we can slowly dwell our discussion to the you know how how well regional parties are performing per states and what kind of changes are we observing uh, like exactly like joy said in the beginning uh, about the role of the central party and their dom- this this lawly emerging dominance within states uh, in the light of the recent uh, local body elections i think uh, I, i i guess i can move into that and just uh, make you guys well into the same so uh, with respect to the uh, local body elections that had uh, happened I, i i begin with kerala session because that that had ended most recently and the kind of trend that was developed uh, where subsequent increase in the number of seats and subsequent representation of uh, bjp uh, was visible within the state per se okay irrespective of the fact then of them being placed third there was subsequent increase in the number of seats that you could observe and it is of course a very uh, improving trend for, for bjp in kerala similarly uh, like uh, it's, a, it's an outright fact that the authority or the obvious presence is getting observed in each and every state so obvious question that comes to my, my mind or might come to a lot of listeners mind 
is that what goes wrong with respect to these alliance parties or where this uh, things go beyond our control, irrespective of these numerous criticisms and all those things that are being, all those things I could only see in a cyber man or like only online. I cannot see anything offline more, no offline more recently, right away. So what do you guys think that this kind of dominant state, which irrespective of these numerous criticisms and this outrage, uh, protests happening uh, across the country. See, I, I think like, uh, just as you point out with regard to the Kerala poll, the most uh, fascinating aspect with regard to local polls was was in uh, Hyderabad. Uh, Vishnu, if you could just tell us uh, how was the entire situation in Hyderabad? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You had the entire yeah, so <laughs> central machinery Hyderabad coming. Is, yeah, yeah. Hyderabad was... Uh... Frankly, for me, it was the best experience I've had after a very long time. I mean, the corona, everything, people forgot what uh, the virus was and the city was in full flow. And we should have seen the way this campaign and categorically, they've won 48 seats, which uh, last time they won uh, three seats, four. the last year uh-huh. in poll. Four uh-huh. seats, yeah. And now four. they had uh, 144 more. So they, if you look at it, they mostly took away lots of seats for the incumbent TRS which was pretty obvious. They, their game plan was to attack the TRS and go after its vote back because no way that they could uh, take away votes from AIMIM. But however, the AIMIM campaign did help uh, BJP, uh, in, uh, work well in BJP's favour because they they won all the Hindu-dominant areas, such as Sikandrabad, Jubli Hills, all the areas where commercial activity is happening, you have uh, BJP operators taking over. So I think it's a positive shift of attitude from people. They do want change. The Hyderabad, uh, now it's confirmed that BJP is the next alternative to Congress. Because earlier Congress was the alternative to, sorry, uh, uh, BJP is the alternative to TRS. Earlier people used to think it was Congress, but now it's coming back to TRS. So what BJP's essential game plan is to go after wherever Congress was in power first, wherever they had a hold, they're slowly making inroads. What they'll do is they'll go after BJP's, uh, sorry, they'll go after Congress's vote bank and we will do a very good job at it because there is no opposition in this country. So yeah, we don't really have to work very hard also. We can make gains out of Congress seats like this. As you've seen in Hyderabad, uh, you'll see anywhere else, even in Kerala, you would have seen that Congress vote share will go down very, 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 very lower yeah. than what it happened. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, that's some strong word with regard to no lack of opposition. So coming to Pascal, um, uh, like with regard to the coalition of partners, there is some kind of a tussle happening in Tamil Nadu as well, wherein there has been an, uh, an aspersion with regard to the, 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 the CM trying to state, state with regard to the, the sharing of seats. So I think they are, they're making it very clear that, that, you know, we are the main party. So what's your opinion on, 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 on whether the center is trying to make some indoors into, into Tamil Nadu as well? See, person's perspective again, uh, I think we are often trying to shift the blame game on the centre just because it's an absolute majority in this country. I mean, like that's not a BJP mistake that the Bharti Janta Party is the largest party in the country. You know, I mean, it's ruling a fat chunk of states also. I mean, like that's not something to blame on the Bharti Janta Party. I think we as viewers and we as uh, proper citizens of this country need to understand that. The people are the ones who are shifting the mandate to the Bharatiya Janata Party. It's not the party which is trying to exercise its powers and come into and, and like garner the people. A coalition is formed between a regional party and a centre party. It's because, I mean, like it's, it's, it's to foster a sense of, again, it can be looked at that way as well. I mean, like it can help in boosting centre-state relations as well to a fair extent. But apart from that, we need to understand that it's purely based on the number games which we are talking about. In Tamil Nadu, if you take for a, I mean, like for an example, the DMK and the Congress are in coalition, and the AADMK and the BJP in coalition. So the CM has recently made a statement when he has stated that the people won't accept the mandate if it's in coalition government, which is in power in Tamil Nadu. Having said this, we need to keep in mind that the AADMK continues to be in a coalition with the Bharati Janata Party. And obviously, I think it's very fair for any party in India, any party in India, if the aspiration is to form government in that particular state, on that particular local body, or in that particular nation. So having said this, I don't think there's an issue with, I mean, like coalition partners trying to be dominant, eat into others, I mean, like vote banks or things and stuff. Because trust is that needs to be there only when it comes to like uh, campaigning and whatever it is being done on ground to garner the people's trust. 
obviously there needs to be a fair i mean like bit of trust between the partners but i don't think you have to play it right when it comes to politics playing it right i don't think politics in india is the place where any party plays it right i mean like every other party which tries to be in a dominant position it would it would want to consolidate its position that is rightfully what every party i mean like deserve to do otherwise they would be a loser i mean like at the end of the day it will be like the uh, honestly speaking it will be aadmk continuing in power for another 50 years down the line and it will be dmk switching sides the bhakti janta party rightfully is trying to do what it does best i mean like it's trying to cut into the vote banks wherever it's possible and feasible for them i don't think we have to blame the party for what it's doing it can be more be attributed towards i mean like whatever they can and if admk is going to be strong enough with the sword cadre it has trust on its own vote bank particularly i don't think they have an issue to worry they can easily face the elections in a coalition and try to consolidate their position as a majority party in the state so that is where i'm coming from i don't think there's an issue with the bharatiya janata party being the I mean like the biggest majoritarian party across india i mean like it's the people's mandate ultimately that matters more See, that, uh, that, i don't think yeah. there's an issue yeah, ah, yeah that's exactly enough. i mean exactly i mean if you can't campaign for yourself that's on you and the kind of effective change that bjp is bringing across the country i think it's not wrong to see it happening at every state it's really yeah. fair that every everybody should get a taste of this good governance yeah uh, what trying to state that every party has its own right to set up its own ambition and trying to expand its own footprint how long will it will, will, will it try to play second fiddle but then uh, like it comes back to the the question like you know why is a regional party being formed a regional party like it usually formed in order to cater to the needs of the local masses uh, to, to the local people like be it on the basis of language or linguistic or or caste based or even on or, on on region based like because you feel that uh, x region is not having enough uh, attention attention from 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 the center or from from from, from anywhere so you try to uh, bring up the aspect of trying to develop your state and uh, trying to push forward the 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 goal that we uh, that uh, we we should not be uh, neglected so that's the that that's the entire picture of of with regard to why the 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 need of a of, of a regional party because they they have the gra- grassroots level knowledge with regard to the ground groundwork situation you are you're talking about grassroots level knowledge you take the example of uh, kishan reddy from uh, telangana or even bandi sanjay okay so you what they are, what trs has not able to not, not being able to do for the past few years kishan reddy has done it since the time is assumed office as mo of state uh, and he has transferred subsequent amount of funds since he uh, uh, since he joined office there have been subsequent transfers of fund he has done lots of things for uh, hyderabad if you see generally and for telangana uh, be it the a package which was uh, announced for adilabad or many other uh, aspects uh, uh, not covering for even the konda pochamba reservoir which people were enjoying so much the central grant was also there in that particular project that a part of the bigger project called kaleshwaram project so it's part of a bigger one so you talk about regional knowledge and regional parties uh, having uh, you know knowledge of grassroots level i think a national party with regional candidates can make more difference and what a regional party can do within its own sphere fair enough fair precisely enough. precisely I, i i i second vishnu on this thing as well i mean like taking the state of karnataka it's a very good example of how national parties have been often capitalizing over the regional parties in the region i mean like if the joyous case will be need to be taken up i think then the janata dal secular should do a more fair i mean like can you can i take it that way uh, hd kumar swami ji has a better understanding of the grassroots issues and hence he needs to be voted to power I don't think many would agree with my statement in that case. So I think it's very much possible that national party parties can actually rule the states, which are, I mean, like continually be dominantly being ruled by regional parties. I mean, like I think that would again enhance a bit of federalism, which we are talking about currently. Why is that the case that certain states need to be cut off, and it always has to be in the hands of regional parties? I'm not necessarily saying that they are not, I mean, like functional or they are not. exceptionally good when it comes to functioning but i don't think again there's an issue with national parties performing better on grassroots level when it comes to i mean like whatever it is they are equally good at what the regional parties are doing except for the fact that they might not have a basic connect with the people that is courtesy of the regional parties and their excessive campaigning against the what do you call as the centers authoritarian power so it's all in the i think i, mean, I like, think even regional candidates of nationalist parties have extremely very good connect with the people and they can bring even more effective change with central administration 
rather than your noob regional administration <laughs> we definitely at the center have a lot of experience in administration than what you can do in your own state and the, i believe the constitution reads india that is bharat so you have to keep that in mind at the end of the day everybody is a citizen of this nation so the allegation of uh, vote cutting by like till recently uh, rajnikant was present so he is part like he was <laughs> putting his party or even the aim 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 in bihar See, so i want to be silent <laughs> so what we saw enough. so what we saw was uh, the allegations being raised by opposition parties that you know the uh, the aim tried to capitalize on our vote but then that the, that's the that's the point because you have been trying to go on vote bank Uh, you are trying to cater into vote bank not considering the development of your vote bank but in favor of your vote bank so that's a very key uh, notion which we which we actually gather i think maria wanted to say something and yeah and joel even like exactly like vishnu stated with respect to uh, performance of the candidates performance of regional candidates represent performance of candidates representing central parties so to say uh, i guess uh, apart from that there is one more important aspect that should be considered when Uh, the so called exertion of power comes into a subject so if you look into numerous alliances that are there per se like where which was even went about the point of that it does not have a proper opposition right now the major problem i guess in most of the cases is that within the party they do not unite or within the uh, or within a particular session there is an absence of unification such that they have issues within them that are to be resolved internally and like if you take up the cases of Okay, I'm I'm repeating the examples of Kerala a lot of times. Kerala a lot of, I I think I know a lot of what state places are about it. Much like your resistance to say now, uh, with respect to the recent split that if you might might have noticed uh, in 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 Congress within Congress, there have been numerous fights within the party leaders who together form like a proper alliance. That's the the performance of the candidates within the states or their the way that they. deal with the issues which have been left untouched by regional parties in their governments for many years do play a role and and i i agree to it uh, to the extent of 50% but i think the rest of the 50% should be addressed with the fact called internal corrosions within the parties like if you take the numerous examples that are there right in front of us which i don't want to literally point out because it's kind of it's kind of you know uh, a known notion that if you have uh, internal uh, you know what should i say the, i don't know if the word properly like uh, internal conflicts are first to be addressed when you actually are going to fight against uh, you know a party who's like super strong uh, at the center so i think apart from the performance taking the uh, performance of the candidates as individuals being taken into consideration as a party if you are not united and if you have your allies fighting within each other i don't really think that you know uh the the whole point of having an opposition really works for us and this is something in accordance to what vishnu stated in his uh, in his initial argument uh joy even i think in the beginning like when we had, when we were talking about uh, the issues that were there in the southern states uh, don't you think that when alliances themselves do not cooperate uh, they will find it like super hard to be a proper opposition for us in the country Yeah, so again, I agree with Maria on that. Uh, I mean, like on that account. I mean, like uh, I think Joel was trying to bring a point. It depends on the leaders again, like alliance leaders. When we talk about strong leaders who can keep their flocks tight, I think it should not be an issue. And the classic case can be Tamil Nadu again. The BJP has already started creating confusions and chaos in the AADMK camp currently. Uh, they aren't really sure if they are going to be accepting Ada Padi K Palni Swami as the NDA candidate for Tamil Nadu. And there's a lot of rifts open in the. ADMK BJP camp, which can be seen, got us have strong leadership on both the sides. ADMK is pretty strong, BJP is pretty strong. But on the other side, we can take a classic example of a DMK and Congress alliance, but Congress is literally dead, uh, already done and dusted. It's only waiting for the funeral song to be played and the body to be cremated in Tamil Nadu. That's all that is left for Congress. I'm not even joking. This is no joke. I mean, like Rahul Gandhi, who was supposed to discuss about the sheet sharing between the DMK and Congress currently, he is on a vacation in Italy, I suppose. so that is where it comes from it all depends on the leader we can't really question i mean like whatever is happening if they do not have a strong leadership again obviously any player who is a strong leader they will try to be dominant enough in their own spheres and that needs to be there that that competitiveness actually depends the interest to which i mean like the extent to which they will work for the people actually if they aren't competent enough even in seat sharing and like exerting the dominance within the alliance how will they even bother to work for the people once they come to power and show the same spirit 
in working for development progress and whatever it is so that's where i'm coming from it all depends on the leadership if the leadership is going to be weak enough i don't think there's a point in making an alliance and then i mean like keeping on getting sidelined for i mean like uh, it's a very classic historic example in 2016 i think congress contested in uh, almost 41 seats in tamil nadu if those seats had been contested by dmk it could have been a clearly decisive win for dmk i think congress won only 8 out of those 41 seats and many are still unhappy with the dmk allying with the congress even if the dmk contests single entity they could actually i mean like create more Not of only that so, even even the recent bihar elections if there was no congress then that guy would have won yeah, exactly yeah. i think we are state yeah. we had a very senior leader from the uh, yeah. party itself which had blamed rahul gandhi for his absence in canvassing when like he was supposed to canvass but he was on a vacation in some hill station i suppose so it all depends on yeah, the leadership yeah. like it bro and in fact the tussle between eps ops this entire confusion which has been created is also playing against the ai idnk in my opinion this entire tussle uh, from the beginning between so eps I, and ops that has always bothered me somehow and i think that bothering people as well and uh, not necessarily vishnu ops is no longer the same charismatic leader who once who who you he used to be i mean personally speaking he has been a very great source of inspiration for me the way he came out from the party i mean like he once he was removed for the chief minister he agitated and almost all the youth in the state were in support of him but he is no longer the charismatic figure he once used to be he has become second fiddle with the party to eps right? i i think it's right to be so i mean like you had your time actually you had your time to be in the line right if you couldn't grab it and take a hold of it i mean like but i don't think there's an issue now the internal rift is there but it's negligent most of ops supporters are now are co loyalists of the party especially and they have shifted side to the eps i think eps is leading the flock very good at present i mean like as far as we know he has done a great job actually from where he was trailing miles behind the dmk he has actually come neck to neck so not election will be very interesting to watch out for actually personally yeah. speaking it's going to be very interesting yeah so so without really digressing into an, uh, an aspect of state politics but then let's discuss the elephant in the room uh, there is just i think Two three days back, uh, Prime Minister uh, Narendra Modi ji has actually stated that you know uh, there would be the the uh, aspect of one nation, one election uh, uh, with, with regard to the the he he's three trying to advocate for a one nation, one election. Uh, how far do you think it's a plausible notion in India? Though yes, it it, it can save costs and it can also save uh, a a lot of. Uh, A lot of time as such, but then um, how does that come into the picture? So, like example today, what we're seeing is that you have you're having elections uh, in uh, month after month, or at least uh, in in a few months you have elections somewhere. You may have local poll elections, you may have uh, state elections, but then the uh, the aspect of a one nation one election, uh, what's the what's what what can be the 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 really uh, fair point with regard to? Because there have been. the the pros being that obviously it saves cost saves the time and and, and can also save a lot of the 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 model code of conduct and and so many other aspects also the the allegation being raised by several uh, members that uh, you know it's a it's a dominant of center over state uh, how, how how can it hamper over the the re- the regional importance but then it's clearly different because uh, what we see is that when when people vote for the prime minister in the lok sabha elections in the state le- assembly elections you vote for your state leaders for example in orissa you uh, you you may vote for pm in you may vote for for, uh, for modi in in, in uh, lok sabha but then in the state body uh, uh, ele- elections you'll vote for uh, uh, navin patnaik or even in delhi what we saw was uh, you, though though all the mps are from, from from the bjp in the lok sabha elections but in the state elections we we saw the vote of the of the local leader uh arvind uh, kejriwal of of aap so don't you think that uh the uh, aspersions or the doubts regarding the one nation one election is a valid criticism though on the point of uh, physicality of cost and time is a, is a, is actually a effective solution it most definitely open to criticism i mean it was not absolute from the beginning so to understand this first we have to understand the functioning of election commission of india and why do we have elections now article 324 of the constitution establishes the election commission of india which is responsible for holding elections across the country and across all parts of india so the idea of one nation and one election is very useful but 
the league the legality of it is extremely open to interpretation and i think it will all it will require alteration of the basic structure of the constitution and this will have to be a a, a proposition which must be consented by every political party i it will definitely uh, i don't think it should be a unanimous decision it should definitely be consulted with every political party yes but sir it does uh, yeah. affect the timelines of rajya sabha and lok sabha yes and the elections across the state how they respected the bringing in synchrony uh, asynchrony to everything it's going to be a huge task but at the end of the day the kind of administration the kind of change which we can bring through having one uniform body across the country is beautiful i mean yeah pascal you wanted to uh yeah so like i don't think one nation one election is a new thing for india i think to 1967 it was the same case i mean like there was i mean like elections being held simultaneously for the state assemblies and the legislative assemblies but following the dissolution of assemblies only back in those days in the turbulent 60s that is when i think uh, certain uh, legislative assemblies were dissolved and like as elections to the state assemblies and parliament have been held, held separately ever since then uh, this idea of converting back to the simultaneous polls has been i mean like discussed by the election commission also time and again in 1983 1990 and i think there was a law commission report and the prime minister narendra modi has revived the idea once again since 2016 when the niti aayog actually prepared a working paper on the subject so looking into this again as vishnu pointed out there's a lot of things which are simultaneous which I mean like looking at a lot of things i mean like reduced cost and stuff i mean like the, there was one more argument which i read the other day which was about the model code of conduct which comes into operation when there's an election in place i think that's a very serious thing cause like it disturbs the government and services in the particular state and like the daily i mean like daily day to day activities of the government are severely impacted and uh, obviously there's populism being uh, used by the parties i mean like they usually give out uh, very impractical and i mean at times even improbable and impossible I mean, like uh, promises to the people just for the sake of winning elections i think that would be reduced to a large extent and even national parties i uh, mean like have a lot to gain from it because like the regional parties cannot necessarily work on like this narrow uh, vote bank politics uh, and sport and federalism also will be strengthened through this uh, announcement I mean, like if there's one nation one election policy because like uh, there will be a, obviously a reduction in the amount of anomalies created due to the president's rule being refused under article 3 of the stuff but looking at the other side of the coin again as vishnu pointed out legally speaking there are a lot of challenges present to this uh, a scheme which we are looking at that is one nation one election it's not i mean like like a one snap thing to be brought into picture i mean like it will take at least another and decades to actually bring this into picture i don't think there's an immediate uh, thing to happen unless and until the party which is in power in the center again pulls off a jammu kashmir kind of thing i mean like it violates article 83 and 172 and i mean like it doesn't take into consideration about the dis- dissolution of the lok sabha state assemblies again i mean like uh, cause like it mandates that the state assemblies and lok sabha needs to be in power for at least 5 years from the date of its first meeting but the one nation one policy Uh, elections ignores these phase i mean like very conveniently so i don't i mean like i'm not exactly sure i honestly speaking i don't have a particular stand on this entire thing but uh, we need to look at a lot of things i don't really see national parties also have their own issues how do you imagine like narendra modi going about the entire country canvassing even though it's held in phases how can he pull up an entire country bjp even that needs to be seen so it needs to be discussed del- deliberated it, it will take a lot of time all the parties and every citizen has to I mean, like half a say on this particular issue, and uh, we would see. I mean, like we are not necessarily the U.S. Uh, I mean, like U.S. Uh, uh, kind of federalism still to go about and like trust and go ahead with such a big uh, change overnight. I mean, like it will take a lot of time, but I mean, like that that needs to be not to be discussed and deliberated. I don't think this is the right time to jump to conclusions on this entire uh, thing at all. I mean, like. yeah i second pascal in this uh, in considering to the impossibility of cost it is like you, we know the entire structure of constitution where amendment itself a single amendment itself is a huge time time consuming process and obviously the this whole uh, bill getting passed will create a lot of chaos per se with respect to resolving the existing uh, you know obvious disputes that will come up but uh, reports state that bjp have actually almost put forth uh, 25 webinars have been arranged that in order to promote the whole idea of one nation one election per se 
and they have even went about to state that uh, unless they receive the consensus of all the parties, uh, you know, in in favor of this particular uh, mission, they won't go about the same. But we cannot actually ignore the historical background brought forth by the very election commission back in 1983, and moreover, back in the 170th report that in 1999 stated that. You know, the, the old situation of the country where we had elections to the Lok Sabha and the civil assemblies which were held all at once. So I think the whole theme is not a, a fresh brewing topic in all in consideration, but uh, in the presence of all these uh, promotions with respect to the agenda, I think this might be a possible uh, thing happening, like Pascal said, in decades, not decades, but in a decade. Finally, with regard to the entire aspect which you discussed in this podcast with regard to the center and state relationship, uh, we are seeing a, a different kind of change. Allegations can be raised, but can they be fruitful enough to be even discussed upon? So these, hoping that you all uh, as, as listeners are able to carry upon this point and trying to analyze yourself as to what kind of, uh, what kind of a government you actually desire for in your state or in, your, in the country as a, as a whole, and what are the key issues which you want them to address to and, 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 and how the, the approach with regard to choosing your regional uh, parties uh, ca- can be the same. So in, in the end, uh, I'd like to say thank you so much for actually tuning into our podcast. And uh, we really, really like that the, the enthusiasm with, with, with regard to the same. So you guys can actually, uh, in fi- final words, uh, Pascal and Cairo, you give us your Pepsi commercial with regard to the the Cairo organization and your and your new event in just one line. Yeah, so on fourth of January twenty twenty one, we are launching a new initiative along with people of Tomorrow Trust, a law student run organization, and we are in the foundation founded by uh, former IPs of the K N Amale. This in Helpline initiative is named as Nibya Anti Initiative, which is going to be three phase, providing telephonic assistance to the people, uh, focusing mainly on women crimes and appealing to the government and the administration. And thirdly, we'll be filing of RTIs and PIs in the High Courts and Supreme Court of India. This is where we are. Uh, looking forward to go out and we have got teams which are working in Tamil Nadu. We are launching the helpline number on the 4th of January. Thank you for listening and tuning into Argumenta Podcast. We would request you to keep on supporting and sharing our content and also wish you a very happy new year. Stay tuned for more viewing contents. We are also available on IGTV Instagram, YouTube, Spotify, Anchor and iTunes and several other platforms. Once again, stay tuned.